Hi, um, I'm Russell Impagliazzo, and it's my honor and pleasure to be talking at the Simons Institute with Dick Karp, who is just completing his five-year term as the inaugural director of the Institute. So um, Dick also is um, probably the most um, influential person, uh, researcher in theoretical computer science, and one of the most uh, influential researchers in all of computer science. So, um, so uh, yeah, as I said, this is really an, an honor to be t talking to you about your career. Well, thank you. I'm not sure I recognize myself in the description, <laughs> but it, any, I'm delighted that you came up from San Diego to take part in this event, and uh, I look forward to your, uh, your questions. So how did you get interested in computation? I was a failed math major. I was, as an undergraduate, I uh, took the, all the courses for the math major, and when I got up to sort of graduate level mathematics, uh, there were people in the classes who clearly were, had a greater aptitude for it than I did. What I didn't know at the time was that one of them was a was going to win a Fields Medal and another one won a Nobel <laughs> Prize. Yeah. Um, uh, Harvard was the kind of place where so. math prodigies sort of popped out of the woodwork. And um, so uh, I uh, began taking courses in the computation lab, uh, which had been founded by Professor Howard Aiken, who created some of the first digital computers. Uh, another influence was that my mother told me that data processing was going to be the, you know, the future, the plastics <laughs> of, the, of, of the future, and that and I should, I should uh, uh, sort of get into it. So I hope your mother invested in the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she was very cautious. She bought government bonds. Oh, wow. um, so, uh, so I began moving my interests into the computation lab. And I, I managed to take uh, all of the theoretical courses they offered. There weren't very many mm -hmm. of them. I managed to minimize my participation in courses that involved soldering or other laboratory <laughs> activities because I knew that I, that was not my métier. <laughs> and um, I, I, um, I realized that e even though the subject was not well developed, um, there was uh, great potential and things were happening. And IBM was dominating the computer field and um, it, it was clear that um, computation was uh, going to be incredibly important in society. And um, how did you think of, you know, when you sort of characterized your work to other people, what did you, how did you describe yourself? Um, I guess I would say that I liked uh, uh, discrete or finite mathematics, that I liked algorithms, that I had a, um, uh, a bent for uh, probabilistic reasoning. Mm -hmm. And I was also uh, very influenced by the developments in operations research, which was a, 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 a budding field after its use in World War II. Uh, and uh, and so I took uh, one of my favorite courses was on uh, computational methods in operations research. And again, the discrete nature of those models and the fact that probability was involved uh, made it uh, very comfortable for me. And I I did well enough to uh, gain the attention of some of the faculty, and uh, uh, that yeah. fortified my yeah. my interest. So. Um, this is somewhat of a digression from the kind of historical record, but um, uh, so there's kind of like a, a wave within com computer science of maybe moving back towards continuous mathematics. So traditionally, just what you said, discrete mathematics has been thought of as the mathematics that's involved in computation. Right. But there's kind of been a synthesis going, showing a lot of relationships between discrete mathematics and continuous mathematics. <laughs> Does it seem like a step forward or a step back? <laughs> oh, I think it's a, a wonderful uh, development. I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled by the uh, work over the last seven or eight years in um, 
in uh, spectral methods uh, and yeah. uh, qu uh, the realization that um, uh, solving linear, solving special types of linear systems of equations can be done very efficiently mm -hmm. and lead to improved combinatorial algorithms. I remember some years ago uh, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, my friend Gary Miller told me that the, uh, the right way to solve network flow problems was through linear algebra, and I, <laughs> I scoffed because I knew very well, it seemed, that the best way to solve those problems was to push flu flow through the network one path at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to concede that the linear algebra mm -hmm. methods really have won the day. Mm -hmm. Also in optimization, I think, uh, the, um, even though in, in theoretical computer science, the emphasis has been on discrete methods combined with linear programming mm -hmm. uh, and uh, later semi-definite semi programming. Uh, whereas in applied mathematics and engineering, there's always been a strong activity in uh, solving systems of equations and minimizing functions uh, by continuous mm -hmm. methods. And uh, here at the Institute, we've, we're running a huge program which brings those two schools of thought together. And it's a very exciting development. So yeah. I think it's quite enriching that these mathematical methods are, are mm -hmm. Reconverging. Re Reconverging. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned the flow problem, and I think that was one of the problems you you worked on a lot. Um, yes. Uh, both, I guess, in the you know sort of when computer science it was a very instrumental in getting um, sort of the ground rules established for algorithm design, but it's also like a, a still a cutting edge research topic. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you think the flow problem is is somehow special, and or is it just a historical accident that it's been it played such a pivotal role? Well, it's such a beautiful example of some general principles. The the uh, uh, it's a it's a special type of linear program whose extreme points are integers. So that that makes it very yeah. special. Um, linear programming duality and the, the use of prices mm -hmm. and so forth um, really was first illustrated in, in the context of the network flow problem mm -hmm. and it's a continuing theme. Um, it's also, uh, uh, it's, it's an example of a problem that's in NP, intersect co-NP by virtue of its formulation mm -hmm. as a linear program. Um, and um, I just, my favorite algorithm is probably the Hungarian algorithm for solving transportation problems or, or matching problems, mm -hmm. where it advances inexorably to the solution. Uh, this is the old fashioned <laughs> way rather than the linear right. algebra way uh, by uh, modifying a flow. So uh, it's just a beautiful example. I, one of the first mm -hmm. books I read in operations research was the book by Ford and Fulkerson on network flow problems. Yeah. Um, so when I teach network flow to, to yeah, I guess, either undergraduates or graduate students, uh, I often like use it as a precursor to NP completeness. Right. Um, because in addition to being a beautiful problem and, and, and important in its own sake, it's also a problem where you have a many surprising reductions, uses of network flow to solve problems that don't seem at all related to network flow. Right. You could even <laughs> figure out whether a baseball team is mathematically eliminated using, <laughs> using network flow. Uh, um, I don't know that one, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, did, did you, do you think that um, looking at the different applications of, of problems like network flow sort of put you in a, in a good mindset to uh, you know, to anticipate NP completeness when it came along? Well, I think uh, there were some other experiences that brought home to me the, um, the possibility of combinatorial explosions. Mm -hmm. um, the, my first uh, assignment at IBM was to work on um, uh, algorithms for, and programs for uh, 
uh, uh, digital circuit minimization. This was before the age of integrated circuits, and so you had these individual gates that cost a dollar mm -hmm. each, and you, had, you, you wanted to use the smallest number of gates to compute a Boolean function. And um, before I arrived at IBM, the group that I, was, that I came to join had already had a lot of success in uh, solving um, Boolean minimization restricted to two-level circuits, mm -hmm. ORs of ANDs or ANDs of ORs. So this is the Carnot map? or, or? Right. Well, Carnot map was a, digi a visual aid. Yeah. yeah, but uh, um, they were dealing with functions of many variables. Mm -hmm. And um, they had uh, very successful programs that didn't guarantee getting the cheapest solution, but could do a lot better than the engineers could do. And, and so that was a big hit at IBM. Um, so we, working with my boss at IBM, John, uh, Paul Roth, a mathematician, um, we started working on multi-level Boolean circuits, and um, we soon found that it was uh, a uh, morass of difficulties, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we never really got a, a useful product out of it. it. The problem was just too difficult. Yeah. Incidentally, uh, the project of minimizing those circuits also was my first example in management because I was cast as the <laughs> boss of a team of uh, programmers. <laughs> and uh, that really wasn't was, my f uh, forte because I, I sort of left, left them alone for months at a time. And uh, that was a contributing factor in the <laughs> failure to <laughs> generate anything useful. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that, that, that project brought home to me the uh, seeds of a, of a um, combinatorial explosion, but there were many other uh, signs that that was a problem. Uh, if you sort of generalize uh, some of the flow problems to uh, set cover problems, mm -hmm. um, uh, you eventually, uh, if, you, if you try to um, generalize matching to sort of three-way matching mm -hmm. or something like that, you immediately run into problems where you don't have a nice characterization okay. and, and the um, combinatorial difficulties seem overwhelming, mm -hmm. and I was aware of that. I also um, worked on the traveling salesman problem with my friend Mike Held, uh, and uh, there again, we were doing uh, branch and bound and, and other uh, basically enumerative methods and realized that I wouldn't have been able to formulate it very well, but I realized that there was a qualitative difference between the TSP, the traveling salesman mm -hmm. problem, and the matching problem or the or the flow problem. Um, so the so the the circuit minimization problem, trying to find the the smallest Boolean circuit that computes a, a function, is so it sort of has a like a, a very rich history. Mm -hmm. um, so it was also widely studied in the Soviet Union yes. at the time, around the same time, I believe. Yes. And uh, that also sort of inspired a lot of researchers in the Soviet Union to start ta thinking about this concept called parabor, right. which is kind of analogous to the intuitive idea of combinatorial explosion that you were talking about. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the in an interesting thing is so. Both this is still a very practical problem. There's whole, you know, a whole subfield of computer science devoted to trying to minimize circuits. Now the problems become a lot more complex because of, there are a lot more, uh, there are a lot more varied costs than just the number of gates. But right. still, the the process, the the problem doesn't become easier. It becomes harder when you have all these different kinds of costs, um, and it also has a lot of implications for complexity. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of surprising that I think this problem is, is very basic, but it's the one, one of the few whose uh, difficulty computational intractability we understand least still. Yeah, uh, I, I guess it's not obviously in NP. Um, it, it depends on exactly how, how you formulate it, it. Exactly how it's presented, but in some, in some presentations, yeah. if you have a compact input, Right. It's not even clear that you have short uh, proofs of, op of optimality. 
So, uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. exactly what the complexity status of the problem is. Yeah. On the other hand, um, there are some like reasons why the problem might not be NP complete, mm -hmm. um, and also some you know things like some connections like if you had a um, a fast algorithm for this problem, you could actually use it to do things like um, prove circuit lower bounds. So prove that other, you know, a fast algorithm for this problem shows that other problems are actually uh, l limited as far as their algorithms. That sounds algorithms. like the uh, impressive work that Ryan Williams has been. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm referring, to, you know, uh, has, has been working on. Yeah, very, definitely uh, Ryan's definitely involved in this. Yeah, yeah. very uh, remarkable connections it's between. between circuit lower well, bounds on the one hand and complexity classes yeah. on the other. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we also brought up, and we keep on mentioning NP, should maybe like, I don't know who the audience is going to be, <laughs> but yeah. maybe we should uh, define our terms at some point. Um, so NP, so the, a lot of problems are about searching for a solution that meets certain specifications through a huge space of solutions or finding the best solution um, when you have some kind of clear objective function. So NP is essentially the class of all the problems that involve search and optimization. And NP complete means that um, if you could solve that one problem, you could solve any problem of that type. So, um, w um, uh, so I'm just explaining this for the, not for your benefit, you certainly know this, but for the benefit of any kind of like hypothetical viewer here. <laughs> um, but um, so one of your, your I guess the, the thing that, uh, the paper that you're, the still is like one of the most cited in computer science, um, cited not a computer science paper that cited not just in computer science, but by scientists of all types, um, is, is your work on NP completeness. And um, one thing I was curious about is sort of the, there were like three papers that, that sort of brought up this area, maybe four if you include Leonid Levin's work in the Soviet Union. Yeah. There was Jack Edmonds' work on, um, on matchings, um, mm -hmm. which mentioned the problem, the, the problem of P versus NP. There was Steve Cook's work uh, on showing that there existed some natural NP-complete problems. And then there was your paper showing how prevalent NP-complete problems were and showing that a lot of the problems people were trying to work on, like um, traveling salesperson, were in fact NP-complete. Yeah. So how aware were you? Uh, uh, so what brought this to your attention? Well, I was quite aware of the work of uh, Jack Edmonds in, in the 60s. He was actually focused more on NP intersect co-NP. Mm -hmm. I think he took it as self-evident that P was different from NP and never actually framed exactly that question. Uh, his interest more was in uh, what he called the principle of the absolute supervisor, mm -hmm. which had to do with um, sort of verification of a, of a solution. And uh, in in uh, modern terms would be called uh, the uh, question of the NP intersect inter co NP. So Jack um, was an absolute genius who sort of blazed new trails in combinatorial optimization. I, I think of the first genera generation as the people who did linear programming and mm -hmm. flows, George Danzig, mm -hmm. Fulkerson, and so on. And then Jack pioneered the next very rich development um, non-bipartite matching, matroids, numerous other things. And, um, and, and he certainly stressed the, uh, the importance of the question of whether there is a polynomial time algorithm for these uh, problems. And he demonstrated some wonderful polynomial time algorithms. I visited him at the National Bureau of Standards one day, probably around 1964 or 65. And it was pivotal in my life because in, in the eight hours I spent with him, he just told me about all of this cornucopia of wonderful results. Um, and, and so um, I was certainly aware of the, um, 
the issues around uh, polynomial time computation. And uh, uh, I also uh, wasn't aware of it at the time, but I read uh, parts of Hartley Rogers' book on, complex, on uh, uh, computability theory, which came out in the late 60s. And uh, that sort of um, got me prepared to think about reducibilities, because mm -hmm. he, he thought about you know, uh, recursive reducibilities. And um, I think that that sort of planted a seed that led me to my re inf work mm -hmm. on reductions. Um, uh, Steve Cook uh, is a wonderful guy. He was uh, at Berkeley. Um, for the fr we overlapped for two or three years. I guess uh, I came in the, in the in the winter of 1968, and uh, Steve was already there and uh, remained at Berkeley for probably five years after, no, three mm -hmm. or four years after that. Um, and I knew about Steve's work on arithmetic circuits and uh, and the like, uh, but his work on uh, NP completeness uh, actually appeared. Uh, he never. He and I never had a discussion of it. I think he had gone off to Toronto, and so I learned about his work by reading his paper. So you uh, never really talked to him directly about this. Or uh, at least not, not at that at time, time. Only much later. Yeah, we mm -hmm. never. No, we never. Uh, we, uh, I never talked with him directly about it at, at that point. Um, but of course, I read this. Uh, paper where he uh, showed the completeness of the SAT problem and uh, also mm -hmm. uh, the clique problem mm -hmm. is sort of in there. Yeah. Um, and I, I sort of had a eureka moment, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that, you know, uh, you know, I've seen all these other problems uh, covering packing, matching, mm -hmm. and so on, uh, sequencing. And uh, I'll bet that they're just as hard as SAT. And uh, so, I began to systematically pursue it and uh, used reducibilities. I actually used a different kind of reducibility mm -hmm. than Steve had used, but that's just a technical point. Mm -hmm. And um, the actual, uh, once I decided to do it, I, I, I was familiar enough with the field of operations research that I knew what the generic problems were that ought to mm -hmm. be looked at. Um, and finding the reductions was actually not so difficult. They, they're, they're not, there were a few that I had trouble with. I remember that I, uh, I think I had to get a little help from Gene Lawler and Bob mm -hmm. Tarjan on the uh, Hamiltonian circuit problem, which somehow had eluded me. Uh, but most of the reductions were fairly easy to find. Um, but I, uh, it was eye-opening for me and also for many other people, that the great majority of combinatorial search problems that we encounter are NP-complete. It's, it's only the rare exceptions that um, are notable and are not in, are avoid the NP-completeness yeah. trap. So just this year, that kind of intuition was formalized with a proof of the, the dichotomy conjecture. Um, are you... Are you? Uh, this is in, with, I know it for counting. Oh, oh yeah, for Boolean. Uh, uh, for, for constraint satisfaction for problems. For constraint satisfaction problems. I had a student, Tom Schaefer, who was in mm -hmm. at the beginning of that. He, he uh, classified um, sets of Boolean primitives into, and, and found a dichotomy result. Um, yeah, I, I'm more familiar, I, I, I'm not, terribly familiar with that work. There's the analogous work on the classification of counting problems mm -hmm. that Jeannie Sai has uh, pioneered. I'm familiar with that. Yeah, these yeah. are nice results. They basically say that all of the problems are, in, are uh, split you? beautifully split. into two classes. Most of them are equally well, hard and the others are equally, equally easy. easy. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, so you mentioned that you you working with some students. You actually have like a, a very large number of very successful grad students you've worked on. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, we were talking about earlier is that these students have very varied careers. Do yeah. you want to talk about brag about some of your students? Oh yes, I'm happy to <laughs> brag about them. Uh, my uh, my first student was uh, a man named uh, Ray Ryder, 
who mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately is deceased. And um, uh, I worked with him during a leave that I took from IBM. And I should mention that uh, I got my PhD at Harvard in 59 mm -hmm. and, spent, and then spent nine years at IBM Research, which was a wonderful place to work. And in the middle of that, I, spent, I took a year off to teach at the University of Michigan. I met uh, Ray Ryder, and uh, he uh, has gone on to, uh, he, w he went on to very important work in, in uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, a field that I really haven't worked in. Um, uh, so um, my students have done various things in uh, networking. There's uh, Sally Floyd, and who, who's done some of the fundamental work on uh, um, flow control in the, in the internet, and and uh, and uh, Phil Gibbons. Um, uh, Faith Ellen has done important work in distributed computing. Um, Noam Nissan is uh, a genius. Mm -hmm. He's a founder of. Uh, of computational uh, economics and game and game oh, theory, game theory, yeah. And uh, uh, it was only nominally that I was his advisor. I learned from him. What, what basically the, the, the information transfer was from him, from Vigderson to him, and from <laughs> him to me. So he taught me a lot, and uh -huh. I taught him very little. Uh, uh, he taught me a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Rajiv Madwani, uh, also unfortunately uh, deceased, mm -hmm. um, did uh, some wonderful work on probabilistic uh, analysis of mm -hmm. graph theoretic mm -hmm. problems for his thesis, wrote a nice book on randomized algorithms with Prabhakar Raghavan. Mm -hmm. uh, regrettably, I turned down their invitation to be a co-author of that book. That was one of my major mistakes <laughs> in life. Uh, Rajiv unfortunately died young, but uh, he he was a guru in in Silicon Valley. He he, uh, he, he uh, was a wonderful theoretician, but he also understood how the valley worked and and was uh, a, a great advisor to to entrepreneurs. Um, let's see who 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 else. Uh, Mike Luby did fundamental mm -hmm. work on communications and and his started a, a company and is now uh, now at uh, Qualcomm, very yeah. successful. Uh, Barbara Simons became president of the ACM. Mm -hmm. um, I could go on. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there are quite a few. But the, the, I guess like the thing that stands out to me is how varied their careers are. Oh, I didn't even mention the people who do computational biology. biology. Yeah. Right. Computational yeah. biology, uh, I never did as well at that as I would have liked, but I did influence a number of students mm -hmm. who did better than I did, like uh, Dan Gusfield and, and Ron Shamir and Eric Shing, who's at the Carnegie Mellon now. Dan was working in that area before it became trendy, I think. Yeah, Dan, that's right. Dan, <laughs> he he Dan pioneered really. a lot of the ideas that would pick up in the, in the um, Human Genome Project that's later. Right. That's right. Um, he, uh, uh, his his book uh, is uh, on uh, sequences and so forth is is um, very very notable and he's done a lot yeah. of important work. So, what was your philosophy in advising students? You know, how did you <laughs> did you give them projects to work on? No, or never, just... never. I, I always wanted them to discover their own problems. Um, I mean, sometimes they gave them a boost. I remember um, uh, in some cases I would sort of suggest a, a starting problem, but basically I wanted them to follow their own path of discovery. And um, they had different personalities and, and different preferences. Some of them liked to do collaborative work with others. A few of them did collaborative work with me. Um, um, I, I was pretty, I've always been pretty laissez-faire. I was sort of, I made myself available, mm -hmm. but I, um, uh, I, I really wanted them to work things out for, the, for themselves. And some were extremely independent. Noam Nissan didn't really need an advisor. Others, mm -hmm. uh, others needed some, uh, some, some guidance. Some um, 
and I, I try to be encouraging and, and uh, be available as a sounding board. Um, But I, th I think the ma the main thing was 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 to f feel out what style each of them desired and and and, and let them pursue that style. Yeah. So one thing um, I remember you saying when when I was a grad student at Berkeley, um, not your student but uh, a student at the same time that you were a professor, is you said um, that what makes um, what each researcher needs to do is find their edge. Mm -hmm. And I th interpret that as finding something that you're particularly good at that kind of synchronizes with your talents. Um, is that what you meant? Exactly, yeah. So uh, in, in my case, I would say that um, part of my edge was a, a, a good feel for uh, probability theory and not not measure theoretic probability, but good down-to-earth discrete probability. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to uh, work with with those tools. Um, I tend to be drawn to uh, finite problems rather than infinite problems. So I, I really like problems where you can do examples. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one, one of my peculiarities is that instead of going out and writing programs to run an algorithm, I will sit <laughs> like a, a, a slave <laughs> executing the algorithm on made up examples to just get a, a sort of intuitive feel for what happens. Like it's, that gives you like, you know, if you just look at the input and output, you're not, you miss the process. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, in general, when you read people's papers, they don't reveal the process or <laughs> how they were led to what they did. Yeah. That's too bad. I think a good expositor should uh, lay out the process. Um, what I'm not good at is uh, is uh, constructing very complicated proofs. Hmm. I would say that I'm not the right guy to help you check out your proof that P is unequal to NP. Uh, <laughs> no one wants to be that guy. <laughs> um, uh, I like to work with people who are better than I am. That that's a big help. <laughs> well, that that's the challenge. Though. You have to find those people. You have to find them. Yeah. So I've I've worked with some uh, marvelous uh, scientists, and uh, I've enjoyed that. Um, I've had wonderful postdocs. I, I must say, uh, Avi Vigderson was my postdoc, and uh, uh, Ravi Kanan, and uh, uh, Eli Upfall, and, and others. So, so yeah. that's been a very enriching experience. Right. I guess, I guess, one of my um, good qualities is that I uh, love to teach and and to organize material in order to present it cogently in the class. Yeah, so you're very famous for that. Um, did, so do you find that you learn a lot by doing that? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's nothing like teaching to uh, enable you to master a subject. You, uh, yeah. you, you really have to learn the subject in order to teach it right. And I think uh, when I first came to Berkeley, uh, I really took my teaching very seriously. I treated each lecture as if it were a command performance of King Lear, <laughs> and they had to really do it right. And uh, I, I, I would be very thoroughly prepared, and by preparing thoroughly, I was able to digress if necessary okay. to answer a question because I, I sort of knew the territory. Um, over time, I got busy with other things. Mm. Uh, one of the uh, aspects of an academic life is, is, is that you get more sort of civic and community responsibility. <laughs> you have more letters of reference to write and, and so forth. And so um, I began to uh, compromise my standards a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the later years, I, I wasn't um, so perfectly prepared and my teaching ratings dropped a little bit. Yeah, I think t students are becoming much fussier too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, w one thing about the ECS department that I belong to at Berkeley, mm -hmm. the standards of teaching are incredibly, incredibly. high, mm -hmm. and uh, people take it very seriously. 
Yeah. I haven't taught. It's been several years since I taught because of my duties at Simons. I haven't had the opportunity to teach classes or the, or the requirement to teach classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure I would enjoy it in the present climate where you have to be a manager of 25 TAs. It's true. TAs. I used to want to um, learn all my students' names. Yeah. Now I want to learn all the TAs' names <laughs> by the end of the course. <laughs> exactly. Uh, my, my colleagues seem to um, adapt readily to this and to actually enjoy it. I mean, I, there are positive things about it. Mm -hmm. If you've been teaching a, a large introductory course and you walk across campus, um, people will point to you and yeah. point you out. But um, I, I don't think I would enjoy uh, teaching these ma mass courses that we're offering nowadays. Have you ever written a textbook or been tempted to write a textbook? No, I haven't. Uh, again, I, uh, I, even though yeah. I was thorough in my lecture preparation, I'm fundamentally lazy. And, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> and um, there's a certain amount of uh, dog work in writing a book. Yeah. Maybe I overestimated the the challenge of it, uh, just getting all the names right in the index and so forth. <laughs> yeah. And I, I've never done it. I've written, I've produced some pretty good lecture notes that could have been turned into books. Yes, I think I have some of those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, you know, so you, you, when you started, computer science was kind of like um, just defining itself as a field. That's right. And you, you mentioned like different aspects, you know, different field, related fields that were kind of all contributed. Right. Uh, there's operations research, there was recursion theory, um, now called computability theory. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I guess even like electrical and computer engineering. Right. You know, electrical engineering played a role. Uh, uh, do you feel like, you know, were so the, then at that time people were like coming together? Now I get a sense that maybe the the field is becoming breaking up more into specializations, yes. and it's harder to communicate. Do you have the same sense? Absolutely. Uh, so there, there, there were. Uh, two uh, aspects to your comments. Um, one is about the various influences at the time I was a student, mm -hmm. and, and the other is about how the field is branching out currently. So as a student, I had never heard the term computer science, but I was in a computation laboratory, and um, uh, I took uh, numerical analysis. I took uh, a number of electrical engineering courses. I was uh, terrible in the lab. I could never make anything work in the mm -hmm. lab. In fact, if I can digress for a moment, uh, some years ago I was lucky enough to get an honorary doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania. And the person who introduced me at the ceremony had been in the lab with me when I was taking a course on pulse circuits. <laughs> and he took time out to marvel that the idiot, <laughs> the klutz, <laughs> who had been in this, uh, in this lab. And but we've already established <laughs> that your edge is not soldering. <laughs> right, couldn't do anything. Uh, could, could ever have done anything worthwhile. Um, so I, anyway, I took a, a number of courses on uh, servo mechanisms and control and so on. So it's quite different than the current mm -hmm. theories, of course, and um, circuit circuit theory. Um, and uh, the courses I liked most were those that had to do with probability and statistics. I just uh, somehow that always resonated with me. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, so if you had asked me whether I was a computer scientist, uh, I wouldn't have known how to answer right. at, at that time. And I guess no one would have asked. Because. No one would have asked, that's true. Um, um, but I had a stroke of luck in, in landing a job at IBM. I went on the market. Uh, there were no academic jobs that I could aspire to at that point. Um, uh, so I interviewed at a number of companies, and IBM was by far the most appealing. And, and I. Um, 
I had to choose between a few different offers within IBM, and I realized that discrete math was what I wanted to be doing, mm -hmm. and so I joined the switching theory group to, uh, as my first assignment. And uh, there, I think, in some sense, the field of computer science was sort of what IBM did, so, okay. so uh, in that sense, I was embedded in it. Right. Um, and uh, I think another influence uh, a little bit later was uh, Don Knuth's work, his uh, volume one mm -hmm. in particular, which um, sort of launched the analysis of algorithms as a, uh, as a topic. I think uh, up until seeing Knuth's work, um, I had been um, pretty naive about step counting and that, that sort of thing. Some algorithms were nice because they were pretty, and I, I didn't really get down to analyzing exactly what the time bounds were. So uh, I learned that par partly from Knuth. Um, and I followed the results in complexity theory. Uh, Michael Rabin came to visit the IBM lab, and we had uh, wonderful con conversations. Um, we lived in the same uh, apartment in the upper reaches of New York City, and we drove every day for a while to, to uh, the IBM lab, and Michael would teach me things as we were wow. <laughs> he, he, he was great. Um, so um, getting to go to IBM was great. Uh, it was a period when IBM had 75% of the computer market, and they could afford to be lavish and just let people do what they wanted to do <laughs> rather than work for clients or customers. Mm -hmm. And they were good, very good people. I learned about integer programming and uh, uh, learned a little bit of linear algebra. And there's, there are certain tools that you can, you know, that can take you a long way. Uh, yeah. Max flow min cut and mm -hmm. linear algebra and churn off bounds and, you know, a few oldies but goodies yeah. that you can use over and over again. So. I learned um, some of the tricks of the trade at IBM. I spent there nine happy years there. What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, so that's like you're talking about how computer science came together with all these different influences. Yeah. Um, there was, you know, electrical engineering and like circuit circuit design. Then was circuit theory was part of electrical engineering, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then there was people like uh, Michael Rabin who were coming from computability, complexity. Right. Yeah. And um, and then Donald Knuth sort of like um, established the rule book. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Wrote the book literally mm -hmm. um, that sort of like said, what what are we doing in designing algorithms? Right. Um, so that's sort of like saying how the field came together. But saying, well, let's go forward like a, a number of years and say, do you feel like the, the field is still cohesive um, or is it maybe becoming very specialized? Are we about to uh, maybe see the birth of other areas sort of emerging from recom recombining different aspects of existing fields? Right. Well, that's definitely happening. So um, for, for a while, um, one could use a very modest toolkit of techniques and make some progress on interesting computer science problems. And these often were problems that had a sort of real world relevance. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were just a lot of things to be, uh, to be done on basic algorithms. Um, but as the field has developed, I used to, I used to compare uh, what we were doing in computer science to 19th century mathematics, <clears throat> that it was still pretty uh, intuitive, that you, mm -hmm. that you could really understand something about all of mathematics. And, uh, and uh, of course, the frontiers of mathematics moved way out so that people in one specialty really have trouble communicating with other specialists in right. different parts of mathematics. Maybe, and maybe I, Gauss was the last one <laughs> who understood it all. Maybe, yeah. But you could you could you could follow a, uh, quite a bit of it in, yeah. in, in back in the fifties, sixties, and so on. Um, but now, uh, different specialties in theoretical computer science 
have become very advanced and, uh, and the frontiers are pretty far out. So you can't just jump into, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, security and privacy mm -hmm. or, or uh, um, cryptography. And, and expect to uh, to contribute mm -hmm. without knowing quite a bit of lore, or in every area, whether it's al computational mm -hmm. algebraic geometry or um, uh, spectral analysis or or um, uh, computational logic, the the field has moved uh, pretty far out. Um, and I think, in a sense, if you think of it as a growing tree. Yeah. It's gotten to some extent separated from its roots in practicality. Yeah. So I think that um, many of the people who, uh, in past times, would have become research mathematicians, are now using very advanced mathematical mm -hmm. techniques in the context of computer science, and and and, um, and they're so, and they're solving very hard problems. But problems that have been refined to the point that their connection to the practical mm -hmm. roots of computation are somewhat lost in many cases. And people don't really care that much about losing those connections because the fields sort of generate their own identity okay. and their own uh, style and open, their own mm -hmm. open questions. Um. Uh, you also asked about new fields arising. Yeah. And of course, this is also true. Um, the um, data science is data That's science, the, big data, artificial, yeah, artificial intelligence, sense. machine learning. Right. I mean, these these have uh, blossomed in the last fifteen to fifteen years, probably. Yeah. Uh, and especially in the yeah. last, just in the very recent past. Yeah. yeah. But maybe this is also like an opportunity because I think. Um, uh, uh, you know, so um, not that I'm an expert on these things, but with the, you know, UCSD, where I'm a I'm a faculty member, is starting a data science major, mm -hmm. and one question we're, we're continuously asking, or mainly that I'm continuously discussing with Mohan Paturi, yeah. <laughs> is what exactly is data science, and you know, what is the scope of data science? What makes something data science? Yeah. Um, and um, so I think it may be in the same stage as computer science was in the 50s, where, where there was obviously something happening, but it wasn't clear what the scope of you know, how that would emerge. Right, but it, it's, it's moving along at a furious rate. So yeah. Ber Berkeley and other places are uh, adopting the philosophy that every undergraduate should be exposed to whatever it is they should yeah. be exposed to it. <laughs> right. And um, but it is. I think maybe the the can, maybe the Knuth hasn't come along to set up the ground rules yet. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. Um, I think it's not so much what it is, because what it is is really the uh, generation of, of, of data and the, uh, of large bodies of data mm -hmm. and the, and the um, uh, creation of insight from analyzing that data. Uh, so that's what it is. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, the, it's driven by the, the influence of uh, the, act, the availability of large data sets okay. in almost any field you can name. Yeah. What's less clear is what the foundations are, mm -hmm. what the mathematical foundations are. Yeah. And it has something to do with sparsification and uh, dimension reduction and all the techniques for, for uh, um, uh, simplifying large data sets to extract the essence. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, real-time decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, um, certainly has a lot to do with advanced statistical methods. It's sort of the extension of classical statistics to the case where you have really large data sets. Yeah, uh, is the size of the data set? I mean, so classical statistics, if you have like large data sets that are sampled from the same distribution, yeah. it should be really good at that. Right. 
I think yeah. maybe it's, the the problem is that you have large data sets and you're with kind of uncertain provenance. Exactly, exactly. The diversity of the data, the combining of different types of data, yeah. Yeah. the fact that the data may have been gathered in a way that made it not representative of a, it's not clear what population you're sampling from. Yeah. Um, and the fact that there's so much data means that there's an abundance of possible hypotheses, some of which will just accidentally seem to be significant. And, yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of class statistics on steroids, yeah. if you will, and, and uh, pro the problems are very hard, and we we don't really uh, we don't really know exactly where it's going. Yeah. There's the related field of artificial intelligence, where um, I mean, if you read the billboards as you drive out to San Francisco <laughs> Airport, <laughs> you, you'll see that there are companies that are offering yeah. artificial yeah. intelligence yeah. to the world and hiring yeah. at, at inflated salaries, hiring people to, to do artificial intelligence. And it's as if artificial intelligence is some magic potion right. that a few, yes. a few high priests possess it. And, and if you can hire one of those high priests, that, that person will be able to sprinkle his artificial yeah. intelligence Puzzle. knowledge over all the problems of the world. Right. So uh, it, it, there's an exaggerated respect for for yeah. what it is, what it really is. There, there's, there's been definite success in solving certain kinds of classification problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, um, but first of all, it's a far cry from what the founders of artificial intelligence meant by the subject. And, and um, you know, sort of the ironic thing is that if you like, go back 20 years ago even, um, I think artificial intelligence had gotten a huge, a bad reputation for being impractical. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, an undeserved, an undeservedly bad reputation at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so the pendulum swings quite a bit, quite quickly. Right. And um, it, it, it's also a, uh, a dilemma for uh, people who are used to analyzing algorithms because um, the success of some of the deep learning algorithms has gone far beyond what we can, what we can analyze. Because, yeah. Um, in fact, that sort of touches on another theme, which is um, empirical, ver empirical validation of algorithms, which is becoming more, more uh, prevalent, I think, in right. a lot of areas. So we, we've seen um, success in um, um, sort of um, uh, Boolean minimization and SAT solvers. Uh, uh, have yeah. have been successful beyond what we can explain. You've worked yeah. a lot on that Medicine sort of thing. Of course. Yes, um, but, um, and but so, work in failing, to, also failing to explain, <laughs> explain it along with everyone else. So there's there's been very striking work by uh, Kevin Leighton Brown, for example, mm -hmm. where he has been able to yeah. classify right. different types of satisfiability right. instances yes. and predict which so algorithms would work well on which of those. Right. Very impressive, but completely empirical. Yeah, but yeah. In some sense. Um, you, you mentioned work with with Held earlier. Yeah, and I think wasn't some of your work with him motivated by some of the same questions, uh, like the Held Carp bound, right. you, using that to empirically validate um, approximation algorithms. Oh yeah, I've always been interested in doing that. Uh, my current work is is along those lines. Um, um, yeah, we, we could never uh, prove anything about much about our uh, traveling salesman algorithm mm -hmm. or the quality of the, I guess the, there's still open questions about the so-called health carp bound. And mm -hmm. There's even current work on the asymmetric version of that, uh, the, the bound as it applies to asymmetric TSPs. There's some beautiful mm -hmm. recent work. But, but um, 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 I don't. I don't sh shrink from experimentally investigating yeah. algorithms if I can right. find somebody to write the code. <laughs> yeah.
So it's, um, is staying like more ground down to earth, being able to look at concrete instances of problems, um, part of the reason why you moved into computational biology a while back? Yeah, back about around the turn of the 20th century, the human, uh, or I guess maybe around 1995, um, the uh, Human Genome Project was bubbling up in its importance. And my colleague, Gene Lawler, was working on related problems. And my former student, Dan Gusfield, had, was pioneering uh, that subject. And I, I sort of, I think it was sort of a machismo thing. I, I, I sort of <laughs> said to myself, gee, if they can do that, do that I, I, I can do it too. There are all these combinatorial problems, and I'll just sort of barge in and see what I can do. And it turns out that uh, it's not so easy. Um, your the theoretical statements, if any, that you can make about your algorithms for analyzing DNA sequences or protein protein mm -hmm. interactions or, or regulatory regulatory networks. It all depends on how, how much insight you can give to the biologist and whether you can get the intention, the attention of a biologist. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is just being in the right place to, to, uh, uh, to assist major projects, uh, um, popularizing your work, writing code that people can easily use. Um, um, and uh, frankly, uh, I, I haven't succeeded to the extent that I would have liked in, in, in that area. So um, uh, I, I, can't, I can't say that I've influenced the, been a big influence on the course of computational biology, uh, except that I've had a number of students who have really done well. Mm -hmm. Eric Shing, Ron Shamir, uh, and, and others. Um, but it's a, it's a tricky business, and nowadays you really have to work with a particular project on particular data sets. Um, in the early days, the late 90s up through maybe 2005, you could sort of work on generic problems that made sense, uh, uh, sequence alignment mm -hmm. or f f phylogeny and, and so on. Uh, but more and more, the good work is being done in, in very concrete contexts with very particular data sets to try and understand particular diseases mm -hmm. or, or particular yeah. mechanisms within the cell. And you, you really have to get down and dirty, so to speak. And uh, I, I haven't uh, been paying my dues by trying to do that. So, uh, so, so I guess sort of where, you know, in the 90s, people were looking at particular, you know, DNA sequences, trying to unravel them, mm -hmm. figure out what the sequences were. Yeah. Now the goal is to find out what the purpose of the, these, these genes are, how they interact right. with all the other proteins in the cell. Right. Um, that's a much more complex and less defined problem. Right. Or, uh, yeah, it's much more difficult. I mean, there are, there are a few particular uh, branches where the problem formulations are clean enough that one can continue to do terrific work. Um, uh, Tandy Warnow, for example, has uh, made a wonderful career in, in, um, in, in phylogeny analysis and, mm -hmm. and sequence alignment that she's continued to find new applications, new directions. And the problems are fairly clean. Um, uh, when you get down to um, looking at proteins in particular, it, it gets harder. It, well, they, they have a three-dimensional structure. Right. You, uh, the uh, combinatorics of how the proteins interact, the data is not very clean. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of impediments. Uh, generally to understanding, um, to doing what you might call cell biology, meaning mm -hmm. uh, the investigation of, uh, uh, of the control mechanisms within living cells this is just a messy subject. So do you have any 
um, this sort of brings up the, the general question of, you know, so traditional theory, we sort of like expect people to bring the problem formulations to us, mm -hmm. but a large part of um, making algorithms that actually solve problems uh, that people want to have solved is coming up with the right formulation. So do you have any insight into how you come up with the right formulation of problems? I'm asking you a tough one here. <laughs> a, tough, a, a tough one. Um, I, w I would say that again, it's uh, it's a matter of uh, getting down in the weeds. Like if you if you want to solve uh, problems for. Uh, of the type that arise in in Amazon or, or Lyft or mm -hmm. Uber uh, or uh, Google, whether it's advertising or routing of vehicles yeah. or, or uh, distribution of goods, uh, you probably have to sit down and uh, see what's going on and you know ride 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 around yeah. with the truck drivers and see what's actually mm -hmm. happening. Uh, yeah, and, and again, it takes a certain uh, Dedication. Yeah. But also, a lot of, you know, there's this, this kind of legal issue. A lot of the, the data for the, the applications you're talking about just now yeah. are, are um, you know, um, proprietary. Mm -hmm. You cannot just get that information yeah. um, and start working on it without having some kind of relationship with the company. Yeah. There are still some some uh, classic problems of uh, of complexity that um, uh, can that are very clean and can be mm -hmm. pursued. If, uh, uh, I think that uh, you've done some you you've sort of injected new life into complexity theory by talking about the strong um, exponential uh, time the strong exponential time hypothesis and where you um, make a very concrete assumption about the difficulty of the satisfiability mm -hmm. problem and then you take that as a hypothesis and, and find out that uh, it implies all kinds of results about other problems lower down right. in complexity. Yeah. That, that's a really neat uh, yeah. dis discovery. Yeah. But again, um, you know, so it sort of has the same shortcoming maybe of some of the work on MP completeness, which it talks about the worst case complexity of this problem, yeah. or you can even talk about the average case complexity of the problem, but talking about the typical case complexity of the problem, where mm -hmm. typical means something that people actually want to solve, yeah. as opposed to a random instance or a worst case instance, that's right. is so much harder. It's so much harder, and, and, um, and that's something that we really need to cope with um, I think that the work on approximation algorithms, where you get guaranteed to uh, create polynomial time algorithms for NP-hard problems uh, that are guaranteed to come within a certain ratio of optimum, um, is beautiful work, which uses very nice techniques from mathematical programming and so on. Um, but it really misses the mark in terms of relevance, in my opinion, because the uh, bounds that you can prove when you're talking about an algorithm that always gives a good approximation are so much worse than what you can actually achieve with those problems mm -hmm. empirically. And yeah. uh, so even though I admire that line of research, I think somebody has to come along and figure out an approach that would ha have more yeah. bearing on as you say, the typical instances. Yeah. So I want to like say that sometimes, you know, sometimes you really care about getting the the right answer to one percent. Right. And sometimes you just care about getting in the right ballpark. That's true. And so, because um, a lot of times you're using an approximation algorithm as kind of a meta algorithm to help steer an, another algorithm, mm -hmm. and so the cost in being off is like a uh, a small factor in the running time of your other algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, or you mentioned like um, uh, the circuit design problem that was successful. Well, I think that, that a lot of those, um, the two level circuit design, you're using like a set cover right. heuristic. And right. so uh, it can be off by a factor of n, but 
um, when you're talking about an exponential size circuit, mm -hmm. and it's not so ba bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's possible. Uh, there's also the complexity theoretic work of showing that it's hard mm -hmm. to um, to um, even get polynomial time I mean, algorithms within any any I close mean, factor of, of optimum, yeah. and I admire that work very yeah. much. And there've been some yeah. real breakthroughs there. Yeah. And that, it's also like one of the, bringing us back to this, the idea of the synthesis between discrete and continuous mathematics, because th there they sort of show that the best approximation algorithm, which is kind of an, a, a discrete concept, can actually be like formulated as uh, the best uh, semi-definite relaxation. Right. And that's a, a more continuous Right. Version. Right. That, that was so you a, get these kind of very interest, you know, strange <laughs> approximation ratios that are the best achievable under plausible assumptions. Right. That's a brilliant piece of work involving the, yeah. uh, showing that semi-definite programming is, in some sense, the canonical way to tackle yeah. those problems. Yeah. What are some of your other favorite developments in in computer science? Well, we've already touched on some of them. I, uh, I've been very impressed with the, uh, the spectral graph analysis and all of the things that you mm -hmm. can do with uh, linear algebra and spectral computation. Um, I, I think the, the reductions from, uh, <clears throat> from the strong ex exponential time hypothesis to prove various concrete results about the about real real life problems are uh, very very relevant, very interesting. Um, um, <clears throat> some of, some of my results have been superseded by better results obtained recently. So there's some very nice work using discrepancy theory, which gets a better bound for the, than uh, Karmakar and I were able to obtain for the. Um, in packing problem, and um, I was happy to see that the linear programming formulation for the asymmetric TSP that I worked on with Michael Held was the starting point for some new exciting results about uh, uh, so solving the asymmetric TSP within yeah. a constant factor. However, an another aspect of um, current day complexity theory is that we're sometimes getting results that uh, depart pretty far from anything that anybody would use in practice. So, I mean, the practical solution of the TSP is quite a different game from, than, uh, than the hey, computation yeah. of those bounds. Um, there, are, there are also what uh, Richard Lipton has called galactic algorithms algorithms that are very good asymptotically okay. but not be but not useful within any practical range so that okay i should say like um uh when i was in grad school people said that the strassen matrix multiply algorithm was one of those <laughs> and yet i i believe you know so you know one reason why people thought that this these algorithms won't be useful for um uh, for um, input sizes that are practical is that input sizes that are practical are so much bigger now right. than they this were true. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Right. So, so, so maybe at some time in the future, the, uh, the work of uh, Winograd et al. on <laughs> matrix <laughs> multiplication will be, also be practical. Well, exactly. Yeah, it's so, possible. Um, so... Um, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about, but now I'm I'm forgetting it. <laughs> oh, so um, when you were starting research in you know the in the field that eventually became computer science, uh, did you imagine computer science uh, as being at all like it is today? And you know, what ways is it surprising to you, and what ways would you have, uh, did you like anticipate? 
development? Well, the you know, there's a whole world of computation and digital communication that we've constructed which sort of lives side by side with the physical world mm -hmm. and the laws governing this world of computation are relevant to everyone. Everybody spends time with digital mm -hmm. devices and benefiting from what you, what you can do with them. I, I, I certainly didn't anticipate that. I mean, uh, nobody did when I was a graduate student. I mean, Thomas Watson Sr. said that there wouldn't be any need for more than five computers mm -hmm. in the yeah. world. Um, now you have five in your office probably. Well, five in your pocket. Five in your pocket, yeah. Um, no, that, that's, no, I had no, no conception. I mean, my mother had told me that data processing <laughs> was going to be important. Uh, but I had, had no sense of how it, of what a sweeping effect it was going to have on on society. So, um, so that uh, that that comes as a complete surprise. And of course, there's a lot to worry about too. Mm -hmm. um, just as one example, people don't read deeply anymore. They have so many okay. sources of information that um, they sort of uh, uh, skim everything. Skim everything, and and uh, the art of Deep reading, or uh, certainly uh, poetry and fields like mm -hmm. that, are, are, are no longer uh, no longer have the the stature and the and the um, provenance that they have had in the past. And I think that's I think we've become shallower, but more facile. We're producing a generation of people who could be great air traffic controllers because they can multitask and and uh, uh, respond quickly to digital stimuli and so on, but there's something lost as well. So I, I, of course, I, n n nobody anticipated all of that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of theoretical computer science, it's been brought home to me at the Simons Institute where we cast our attention um, on different themes every semester and, and bring together mm -hmm. the experts in, in those thematic areas. Every semester, uh, I find myself behind the curve because, you know, uh, the cryptographers come in and they know all about uh, all the latest developments mm -hmm. and computing in the cloud and so on, and it's all new to me. And then the next semester, it's mechanism de design and economics, and a new bunch of experts come in, and I'm constantly behind the curve and discovering that the frontiers have gone out very far, and this is, yeah. of course, wonderful, yeah. but uh, somewhat intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you know? So, so, like a new grad student is in the same situation, right? In some sense, they're like forty years behind. Yeah. Um, so, what advice would you give to a, a grad student starting out, how to not to be intimidated? That's a tough question. I know. I, I would suggest not losing contact with the real world of applications and, and not um, not simply jumping into some body of theory that because it's there, but mm -hmm. but actually thinking about what might might, might accomplish, what might matter, what yeah. might lead to an accomplishment in the world. It's probably good mm -hmm. to have a a secondary interest besides theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, we've seen many generations of graduate students coming through and thriving, and it continues. Berkeley is one of the places that keeps producing fantastic graduates, so mm -hmm. somehow they're managing. I think being open to working with other people, um, um, not being jealous of your results, <laughs> but, you know, uh, being out there and collaborating is very important for students. Learn a lot of mathematics. One of my regrets is that there are certain branches of mathematics where I'm fairly ignorant and uh, that yeah. could have been relevant for me and uh, yeah. I would have taken more math instead of those engineering courses that I took if I had known. So you know. often like students say, um, what area of mathematics should I learn to do computer science? 
And I think my, my answer is, well, look at all the areas that have been applied successfully to computer science and learn something else. So, something else, like maybe, maybe, it's, maybe topology is going to come to the fore. Right, although I, I already know some applications of topology. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, yeah. String, so, string but, theory. But, it, but it's, relatively, it's relatively untapped. Right. So, because I think one, one way of getting an edge is to know something that other people don't. That's true. And you don't know what's relevant. And to, you know, if you don't know an area, you don't know whether or not it's relevant. Right. That's why I like this, uh, this um, um, optimization program that we're running mm -hmm. at Simons, because I think it's bringing people together with different, who will learn from one another with very different skills. Um, how is your experience? What, what do you, you know, what do you think of the role of the Simons Institute in theoretical computer science today? And what was your experience as director? Uh, it's been successful far beyond my my dreams, and that's the work of uh, many many people on our on our staff and uh, the other scientists who've been in the leadership uh, team of the Simons Institute. Um, uh, uh, it's really become the place where people want to go to um, gather and, and advance the field. I think it's bringing collaborative research to a, a, a different level. Um, um, for, for me, it's been mixed because um, I somehow discovered that I'm not meant to be a manager, exactly. Uh, but there have been, been enough mm -hmm. skillful colleagues to cover my deficiencies, <laughs> so it hasn't gone too badly. Um, uh, now I'm yearning to get back and, and really focus on research in a so way that I haven't what's been What's your upcoming project? Or do you have it, have you decided? Well, I've been working on uh, a, a certain uh, problem called the group Steiner problem. It's one of the classical NP-hard problems. And I've got some ideas about um, algorithms, which I have tested partly through computer programs mm -hmm. and partly from doing lots of little examples. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I might have some good ideas there, and I'd like to pursue that. Um, I'll continue to be interested in bioinformatics. I'll continue to be interested in foundations of data science. Um, I'm told that you're going to be on the other side as a program organizer for an upcoming program. Yes. Um, um, yes, this began a few years ago when I heard a, a talk by um, an astronomer named uh, Joshua Bloom. Uh, who is also very skilled in computer science and machine learning. <clears throat> and he talked about robo robotic astronomy. Uh, he talked about the fact that um, astronomers don't really point the telescope anymore. The, teles mm -hmm. the directions that the telescope takes, the areas of the sky that are chosen for examination, are chosen by algorithms. And these algorithms have to take into account massive amounts of data that, they, that the telescopes are generating and decide in real time which of the many images they've taken to throw away, uh, which ones to keep and analyze, and how to use the results of that analysis to decide what's likely to be interesting and where to mm -hmm. look next. Uh, so that's an example of a problem where massive amounts of data are being gathered. The data, uh, some of the data has to be uh, discarded. Other has to be, other parts of it have to be analyzed deeply. Um, and there's a, a feedback loop where the right. results of the analysis of the data affect the next decisions in which data mm -hmm. is going to be derived. So so that's also, like a challenge to traditional statistics, in that you're, the way you're gathering the data isn't independent of the data. Mm -hmm. So 
trying to reach conclusions, you have to worry about uh, sort of, I guess, this like uh, bias towards your, your confirming your own <laughs> hypotheses. <laughs> Yeah, I hadn't explicitly thought about that, but uh, that is an important complication. Um, so it turns out that there are many other uh, areas yeah. where uh, a similar feedback between rapid decision making and action uh, occur. It's in managing the energy yeah. grid, in uh, certain aspects of managing urban transportation, in um, uh, making a quick response to emergencies such as uh, earthquakes, um, just a, a lot of um, different application areas which in terms of their domains of application are very different from one another. Mm -hmm. uh, another example is the Large Hadron Collider at uh, uh, Geneva where um, um, nuclear collisions are being uh, uh, observed and, and processed. But also like even like uh, self-driving vehicles. Self-driving so vehicles, yeah, it's closely related to control theory and, yeah. and the like. Um, and so this, uh, this program um, that's coming up in the spring will bring together uh, um, domain scientists in those mm -hmm. various domains Astronomers, um, uh, earthquake uh, seismologists, um, etc., um, with uh, people uh, who will be using statistics and mathematical modeling uh, and control theory and streaming and um, real-time analysis um, to uh, try to study this decision-making process. Uh, so it, it's a it's a rich stew of different topics, but somewhat somewhat diffuse compared to the usual rather focused program at Simon. So it's not clear. It's clear that we're going to have a lot of fun, and there'll be a lot of interesting topics yeah. discussed. Um, whether some universal methodologies uh, are derived is is an open question. Yeah. You know, if you're looking at areas as distinct as robotic astronomy on the one hand and scheduling uh, traffic lights on the other hand, uh, you know, it's unclear yeah. whether um, the intersection yeah. of all those areas has something substantial, yeah. but we'll explore there's, it. There's also like the social issue. You know, a lot of the Simons programs have the theme of bringing together researchers from different communities, but once you're there, there's you have to fight the inertia of people working with people they already are kind of familiar with, using yeah. language they're already familiar with. Yeah, we'll have to deal with that. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that we owe it all to the wisdom of Jim and Marilyn Simons in um, seeing something worthy in what we were trying to do here and uh, making a very substantial uh, investment and, and uh, being encouraging all along with saying nice things to us about how we're doing and, and uh, showing continued uh, interest. And uh, it's wonderful to see such a philanthropic attitude from uh, yeah. and it, yeah. you know, the people in the real world who understand the value of fundamental science. It's been a privilege of my life to be in a position to help with help the team to make it work, and uh, I'm very gratified that it seems to be working out so well. Mm -hmm.